start. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday school session. Um, I know it's rainy outside, but I thank God for those of you who decided to come out anyway. And I thank God for those of you who are watching online. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, that we have made up our minds that we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for bringing us into your house. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, which is spirit and which is life, which is unchangeable. And as we look into your word this morning, God, I pray that you'll enlighten us, open the eyes of our understanding. God, help us to find the truths and the treasures that are hidden in your word. And when we have found them, help us to hide them in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies towards us. And we pray that you'll teach us through the Holy Ghost this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so this morning we are going to continue our studies of King David. We have been looking for the last two weeks, two or three, with David. Um, so Sister Mosa gave us this powerful um, start to the lesson about David, the worshiper. And she, you know, took great pains to tell us the difference between praise and worship. So I hope that we have um, learned the difference between praise and worship because David was a worshiper. Last week, we did look at how David sinned, how he went from hero to zero um, in, in a short period of time. And today, we're going to continue our studies, and we are going to look at the power of repentance. That's the title for this morning's lesson. Of course, you know that this session is not interactive, and you don't get a chance to ask questions, and we don't get a chance to really communicate because of time constraints. And so if you have questions, if you have comments, if you need clarification, if you have suggestions, then we do have an email. It's asktheteachers at oneness.nyc, and we'd be more than happy to clarify anything that you need. All right. So if we're going to talk about the power of repentance, we're going to have to start from the beginning. And the beginning would be the sin, because it is sin that leads us, makes us need repentance. All right, so I'm going to start at David's sins. So first sin, 2 Samuel 11, verse 2 to, I'll read to maybe 2, 3, 4. It says, and it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returned to her house. So that was sin number one. Um, it was the sin of adultery, right? So Bathsheba was another man's wife. She was the wife of Uriah. Um, David himself was married. I think he had two wives at that point and several concubines. And so um, he sent and inquired after this woman, was told that she was married not just to anybody, but to his faithful, loyal warrior who was at that time in battle, fighting, and he slept with her. So he committed adultery. Sin number two, verse 14 and 15, it says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. So his second sin was plotting the murder of Uriah to cover up his first sin of adultery. So he wanted to hide the evidence of his adultery. Of course, um, so the cover-up deepens. And, and we know the story, so I'm not going to go through all of it, right? We, we know it very well. We've read it a lot of times. So David not only sins, but then he tries to cover up the sin. 
And so verse 26 of that same chapter, it says, And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. So here is David trying to cover up his, his, his sin, trying to smooth over his sin. And so he gets Uriah killed, right? And then he once Bathsheba stops mourning for her husband, he sends for her and he marries her. So now it looks like all is well and it looks like they're just one big happy family, right? Or so he thought. But the word of God says at the end of verse 27, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. All right. So what does God do when we sin? What he does is he has a court case because he's a righteous judge and he's going to bring us up before him because he wants to give us a chance to defend ourselves. He doesn't just accuse us, right? He gives us a chance to defend ourselves. And so in this case, Nathan is the DA, right? He's the district attorney. And so he goes to David and this is the court case that he brings to David. Second Samuel chapter 12. And it says, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, and we know the story, right? I'm not going to read all of it. So he tells Nathan about these two men that were in the city. One was rich, one was poor. One, the poor one just had one little, you know, ewe lamb, and the rich man had everything um, that he could think of. He was rich, but there came a traveler, and the rich man didn't... Um, you know, dress one of his own lambs for the traveler. But he took the one lamb that the poor man had and he killed it and dressed it for the traveler. So that's the story that Nathan gives to David. Here's the part that I want us to take note of. It says in verse 5, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And not only shall he surely die, but before he dies, he's going to restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So David, before he knows that the case is about him, already just from hearing a recount of the story, decides on the verdict for the man and he decides on an appropriate punishment based on what he has heard, right? And I just thought to myself, isn't that just like us? As long as it's somebody else's sin, then we are quick to judge and quick to pass sentence and quick to call God's and everybody else's attention to it. When it is somebody else's sin, we become judge, we become jury, we become executioner. We want God to rain brimstone and fire down on people when they sin. Because, you know, we're so filled with righteous indignation and we're so angry. Like, how could they? Right? And we want to take the little moat out of their eyes. And we just totally ignore that there's a beam in our eyes. And so here is David. He's angry. He has this righteous indignation. He decides that the person is guilty and that they must die. That's before he knows it's him, right? And so um, after every court case, of course, they have to pronounce a sentence, right? That's what they do when they have a court case. And what happens is that David's verdict does, in fact, line up with God's verdict. Because what is the verdict? Guilty as charged, right? So he was right that the man who did this thing is guilty and deserving of death and should restore what was stolen. And so we know that Nathan does pronounce that verdict on him. Nathan says, thou art the man. It's you that I'm talking about. You are the guilty one. You are the one who deserves death. You are the one who needs to do this restoration. It's your case. All right? And of course, because God is a good judge, and if you have ever watched any judge show or 
been in a courthouse, you know that before the judge passes sentence, he gives them a little speech, right? And tells them what he thinks and why he's going to sentence them to how many years or whatever the punishment is. And God is a just judge, righteous judge, no different from our judge. Well, he is different because not all judges are righteous. But because he's a good judge and a righteous judge, he does tell David through Nathan why he's going to punish him and why he's guilty. And so Nathan proceeds to tell David what God says, like, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And he tells David all these things that he has done for him. I took you from the sheepfold, I made you king of Egypt, and if you had wanted anything, I would have given it to you. You lacked nothing that I would not have given to you, because I love you that much, I would have given it to you. And so David, um, Nathan asks him, Wherefore this? then hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight. And so Nathan is telling David, like, listen, you have violated, you have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Which commandments? Commandment number six, you know that it was in the time of the law, they had the Ten Commandments on the table of stones along with some others, right? But in the Ten Commandments that Moses gave to them, the sixth commandment was, thou shalt not um, commit murder, thou shalt not kill. And the seventh commandment was, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so when Nathan told him, you have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, he had transgressed both of those commandments. And here's what Nathan says, you have done evil in the sight of the Lord. And I just want to pause to let us know that sin, when we transgress the law of God, when we sin, it is evil in the sight of God. We can't pretty it up, we can't cover it up, we can't call it, you know, what it is not. It's evil in the sight of God. All sin is evil in the sight of God. What we call big sins, little sins, they're all evil in the sight of God. And when we have sinned and we come into the courthouse of God, we're not going to win. We don't have any defense, right? It's going to be a guilty verdict. All sin is going to get the same verdict. We are guilty because we have transgressed some commandment or some law of God. And of course, you know, so God, after the guilty verdict, and like any good judge, he's going to pass the sentence. And so, what do we know about the sentence for sin? The word of God says the wages of sin is death, right? That's the wages, that's the recompense, that's the reward for sin. And so, all sin deserves death. That's the reward that we get for death. And, and so we want to thank God that we live in this dispensation of grace where Jesus already died and paid that penalty for us so that we don't have to die when we sin. But the wages of sin is death. And so if we skip down to, um, well, before we skip down, so God tells him what he's going to do, his sentence. He says, I'm going to raise up evil against thee out of your own house. I'm going to take your wives before your eyes and give them to thy neighbor. Your neighbor is going to lie with them in the sight of the son. We know his son Absalom fulfilled that part of the sentence. He did lie with his wives on the roof of the palace, right? And God says, you did your sin secretly, but I'm going to expose you. And this is going to be your sentence. But being the merciful God that he is, he says, how be it in verse 14, this deed that you have done has given such a great occasion to the enemies of God that I'm going to spare your life, but the life of the child I will have to take. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Something must die when we sin. All right? And I want us to take note of the fact that he says, by sinning and covering up his sin, he has given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme the name of God. And so when we sin, we have to read into these things. When we sin, what we actually do is give an occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme the name of God. When we take on the name of Christ and we say that we are Christians and we have his name, right? And everybody knows that we are saved and that we are Christ-like. Then when we do sin and we cover it up, 
then what we do is give an occasion. First to the enemy, which is Satan, right? Because he already goes and accuses us before God. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so when we sin and we don't repent of our sins, we give an occasion for the devil to say, see, hmm, that's your child. That's the one who has your name. That's who you died for. Because God didn't, he did, you didn't die for me. But see that one? That's the one you died for. See how she's doing? See what he did? Right? And so he accuses us. And, and, and also the sinner. Those that are without. Those that are not saved. When we sin and we try to cover it up and we don't repent of our sins, we know how they accuse us also. What's the first thing that somebody who is not saved says when they find out that we have sinned or they know that we have sinned. Hmm. See them, Christiania? Me tell you about them, Christiania? That's why I'm going to go to church. A pure hypocrite go to church. Isn't that what they say? And so we give occasion to them to blaspheme the name of Christ. And that's why we have to be so very careful when we name the name of Christ. We have to walk circumspectly because people are looking at us and they're going to blame not us sometimes. They're going, Jesus, a Jesus people, them they, a them so them save. That's why I may not trust them. And they say all these things and they accuse us because we have given them an occasion to blaspheme the name of Christ. All right? And so we ought to be um, just extremely careful about our behavior when we have or we name the name of Christ. Amen? All right. So let's talk about sin for a minute. The word of God says we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Right? Um, it's our natural disposition. It's our natural proclivity. It's our natural inclination to sin. Nobody has to teach us how to sin. We're born knowing how to sin. And if you want to see an example of that, just look at a baby or a two-year-old or anybody growing up. You don't have to teach them to sin. They're born. All of us are born knowing how to sin because we're born with that Adamic nature, which is a sin nature. But this morning we want to, I will, I want to just warn all of us, myself included, that sin is a very dangerous and a very slippery slope. Why is it dangerous and slippery? Because it, we're unlikely to stop at one sin. And for example, you know, if you start taking stuff from work, so you start taking a pen, you know that very soon you start moving to start taking a box of gloves and then some toilet paper. And then you start, if you have access to the card, you start buying, you know, computer ink for your computer and the one at work and paper for your computer at home and the one at work. And very soon you have become a thief. It started with you just taking a pen. But sin is so slippery and so dangerous that it, it carries you down a slope once you start with it. What else? Usually one sin leads to another sin. It's very unlikely that you're going to just stop at one sin because once you start one sin, it becomes easier to do another sin. And if we want to look at the life of David, David started with just being idle. There was a war. He's a warrior. He's the king. He's supposed to be there, and he's home walking up and down in the palace. So first of all, he was just idle. What did that idleness lead to? Lust, right? going on the roof, spotting this beautiful woman bathing and deciding, oh my gosh, what a beautiful woman. I have to, you know, bring her over here. And that lust leads to envy because when he inquired of her, he was told, that's Uriah's wife. Did that stop him or mean anything to him? No, he decided, why should Uriah have this woman? I'm the king. I can have her too. And so that envy of somebody else's wife led him to abusing his power because Bathsheba probably had no choice. The king called for her. He sent to fetch her. What is she going to do? Say, I'm not coming to the king. You're not allowed to say you're not coming to the king, especially in those times and being a woman. And so she had to go. And so he abused his power. And that abuse of power led to adultery. His adultery led to, led to murder, then to a cover up and a deception. And you see the slippery slope. It's from just being idle, but you see how far it is. And that's why people say all the time, and it's not a cliche, that sin takes you farther than you want to go, and it keeps you longer than you want to stay. We cannot have 
unresolved sins in our lives. I know sometimes we think, you know, I'm just going to do this one little thing, you know, just one little thing and then I'm not going to do it again because God understands. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He understands that sin is evil. He understands that sin is a rebellion against him. That's what he understands. Not that he understands why you think you had to do it. And um, when we read verse 27 in another version, you know, the King James says God was displeased with David. But the other version that I read, the NASV, it says that the thing that David did was not just displeasing, it was evil in the sight of God. Because that's how God looks at sin, not just as a displeasure. It is evil in his sight. And if we don't start looking at sin the way God looks at sin, we won't think we need to repent because we're going to think, oh, that's not nothing. It's just one little white lie. You know, I had to do that. And so we go down this, we start down this very slippery slope um, that sometimes it's very hard to come back from. We don't want to start down the slope in the first place. So just two things to know about sin. Number one, sin separates us from God. Sin is rebellion in any, well, sin in any form is rebellion against God. It's either rebellion against his word, rebellion against his authority, rebellion against his holiness. But sin of any kind is rebellion against God and sin separates us from God. It drives a wedge between us and a holy God, right? It disturbs the peace that we have with God because there is no peace in sinning and remaining in sin. And so sin separates. Not only does sin separate, but sin brings death and judgment. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And so a holy God and a righteous God must punish sin. He's a just God, meaning he does the right thing. And if he says the wages of sin is death, then our sins are going to be judged and that, that judgment is death. And so the only way when we sin to restore the relationship between us and God is through repentance and forgiveness of sins. We repent and God forgives us. And so we come to repentance, which is what this lesson is all about. And what is repentance? It's any of those things that we see there. So repentance is it's contrition, it's confession, it's, you know, trying to appease our conscience, it's changing our ways, it's shame and sorrow, and sorrow over what we have done, it's, it's, it's remorse, it's apologizing, it's contriteness, it's penitence, pick any word. It's, repentance is a combination of some or all of those words that you see up there, right? That's repentance. And when sin is present in our lives, we need to repent. We cannot live and just go about our business happily, you know, coming to church and tithing and, you know, doing our stuff when there is sin in our lives. If we have sinned, then we need to repent. All right? So Numbers 23 and verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. But in the Old Testament, we see the word repent referring to God, like God repenting, because it shows that God relents or God changes his course of action. All right, and so in Genesis 6, 6, we'll see that God repented that he had made man. And like in 1 Samuel 15, we'll see that God repented that he had made Saul king. And in, in, in Jonah, we see that God repented of the evil that he was going to do to Jonah, to um, the city of Nineveh, because they repented. And so God repented of the evil that he was going to do to them. And so that's the context that it is used in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, and usually I don't do Greek. I do look it up for myself, but usually I don't teach it. But I want us to get the gist of what repentance is. And so in the New Testament, the word that is used for repentance is metanoio. Metanoio. All right, I had to do that a couple times just to make sure I pronounced it right. So it's metanoio, right? And it comes from two words, meta, which means to change afterwards, and neo, which means to perceive. And so what I, and that neo comes from the word noose, which is the mind, and we know that the mind is the seat of our moral reflection. So in essence, what repentance means is that we change our mind 
after we perceive that something is wrong. And that's the gist of the word repentance. Change in your mind after you perceive that something is wrong. Which means if you don't perceive in your mind the seat of your moral reflection that something is wrong, you're likely not to repent. All right? But that's the gist of the word repentance. All right. So the Bible or instruction manual, it gives us, it actually gives us a formula for repentance. What is that formula? It's what we repeat, you know, day in what we know all, you know, by heart, by rote. Second Chronicles 7, 14. The word of God says, if my people, us, who are called by his name, us, shall, number one, humble ourselves, two, pray, three, seek the face of God, four, turn from our wicked ways, then he says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. And so it's a four-step program. Let's call it a program. It's a four-step solution, right? A four-step resolution. We humble ourselves, we pray, we seek the face of God, and we turn from our wicked ways. And of course, we know that was the answer that God gave to um, Solomon when Solomon prayed and interceded for the house of Israel after they had made um, the temple. Then God came to him in a dream. And, and you know, Second Chronicles 7.14 is what God, God told Solomon. That's how I'm going to heal your land. That's how I'm going to forgive you. That's the method that I will use to make sure. Right? And so it starts with number one. We're going to look at each of those four things. It starts with number one, humility. Because he says, humble ourselves. And of course, our greatest example of humility is Jesus himself. Right? From the NIV, Philippians 2, verse 5, it says, In your relationships one with another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. What kind of mindset did Jesus have? He was the very nature God but did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. The King James says, of no reputation. He took on the form and the nature of a servant, was found in human likeness, and when he was found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient, even the death of the cross. And so Jesus is our example of humility. I want us to understand what true humility is. True humility is the honest recognition of our worth. What do I mean by that? Seeing ourselves like God sees us. And so berating ourselves and belittling ourselves and degrading ourselves is not humility. It's not how God sees us. Who does God say that we are? He says we're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a peculiar people. He says he has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He says we're hears and joint hears with him. He says he has made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says we're the righteousness of God in Christ. That's how he looks at us and that's how he sees us. And so when we belittle and berate ourselves and think we're being humble, we're not. B humility is looking at ourselves through God's eyes. No less, we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but we don't think of ourselves as littler than we are either. We are who God says we are, no more and no less. And so true humility is recognizing who we are in Christ. That's being humble. Recognizing that we're sinners saved by grace. That's humble because that's how God sees us. And so if we want to be humble, we have to look at ourselves through the eyes of of God. All right. So David wasn't around when Solomon, David had died by the time um, Solomon got this formula. But I want to look at David's repentance journey through what God told Solomon and see how he measured up. Right. So first of all, David did start his repentance with humility. In 2 Samuel 12 and verse 16, it says, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. So David, even though he didn't get that specific instruction, he knew 
that he had to humble himself, and he started with humility. And we know, we know that he stayed in that posture, in that state of humility for seven days because the word of God says the child died on the seventh day, and that's when he got up from his fasting and lay upon the earth. And so David knew how to humble himself. And I just wonder how many of us, when we sin, and that sin is pointed out to us, or we recognize that we're sin, how many of us go into fasting? How many of us humble ourselves immediately before God? And how many of us are just wrong and strong and decide that, you know, we can just brush it under the table and we don't need to repent? I hope none of us, right? Um, and of course, it was during this time of deep sorrow. David was contrite. He was repentant. He was humbled, right? He had regret. And so he fasted and he lay on all night upon the earth. And that's when he wrote the psalm that all of us know, that all of us use, that all of us should be saying every day, because every day we do something that we need to repent of. It's the go-to and the blueprint of repentance. That's when he wrote Psalm 51, that most of us know by heart, right? And so Psalm 51 is going to be the foundation of how we repent. So David starts in Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. We have recited it a lot of times. I want to start with verse 3. David says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Repentance starts with acknowledging that you have sinned. If you can't even acknowledge your error or acknowledge that you have sinned, you will never repent. Repentance is after you perceive that something is wrong, that you have transgressed the law of God and you have to go to him. And so repentance starts with an acknowledgement that you have sinned, right? Then verse 4, he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. So after you acknowledge that you have sinned, you need to acknowledge who you have sinned against. So most of us, that when we sin, our sin doesn't only affect us. It is very likely that our sins affect other people and that our sins hurt other people. In this case with David, he hurt Bathsheba, right? Because he took her from her husband. He lay with her when she was married to another man, and he hurt Uriah, right? Uh, by killing him. And so his sin did hurt. But what did David do? Yes, our sins hurt people, but ultimately our sin is against God. When we sin, it's God that we sin against. And so if you think you can just get away because, oh, it's just, you know, Sister Lana I sinned against. I'm not even going to apologize to her because, ah, she, you know, nothing. It's, it's not nothing. I don't need to do that. If we think of sinning against people, then we're not going to repent. We have to realize that our sin is against God. It's against his law. It's against his commandment. It's against his authority. It's against his holiness. It's against the path that he has laid out for us to take. All right? It's against his will. It's against his word. When we sin, it's against God. And we have to look at sin as against God or else we won't go to him and repent. And so David acknowledged that he had sinned. He acknowledged that his sin was against God. And then in verse 1, I'll go back to verse 1, he falls on the mercy of God. He says, God, have mercy upon me. When we repent, what we do is fall on the mercy of God. We're appealing to the mercy of God. What is mercy? It's God not giving to us what we deserve. We deserve death. But he does not give that to us, right? And none of us deserve mercy. None of us can earn mercy. It's something that is freely given from a merciful, compassionate God. 
the word of God says, his mercies are new every morning. His compassions fail not and great is his faithfulness. And so when we go to God, when we acknowledge our sins and acknowledge that we have sinned against him, we fall on the mercy of God. We appeal to his mercy because we know his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. We know that his mercy is forever. And so we fall prostrate before him and we appeal to his mercy. All right. Second one, I have to run, um, prayer. So we humble ourselves, and then the solution was, next thing we do is we pray, right? So there are several quotes that I've heard about prayer that I like. I did have three of them that I, that I really like and that I've, that I've used. One of them, and I didn't write that down, but it says prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. Prayer is us giving God permission to intervene in our lives and in our circumstances. People always say God is a gentleman, right? He's not going to butt in where he's not invited. And so our prayer is us giving him permission, giving heaven permission to come down and intervene in earthly affairs. That is what prayer is. Mother Teresa says prayer is putting oneself in the hands of of God, because that's what we do when we go to God, especially in our prayers of repentance. We're putting ourselves in His hands of mercy and His hands of compassion. And this one I heard recently that I do like it says, Prayer is not talking to God, prayer is talking with God. Because if we're just talking to somebody, then it's a one-way street. They might be listening or not listening. Maybe they don't have a chance to get into the conversation, right? But when we're talking with somebody, we're developing a relationship. I'm talking, you're listening, you're talking, I'm listening, and it's now a relationship and a conversation. And so our prayers is not just us talking to God. Our prayers is us talking with God. All right, and there must be consistency and effort and attention in our prayers. And I, I did this um, four P's of prayer when I, when I did the lesson on Abraham, but just to reiterate, our prayers must be a priority. Especially when we sin, we can put off praying. It's not when we have time. It's not I'm late for work this morning. It doesn't fit into my schedule. We have to prioritize prayer. Our prayers must be passionate, meaning they must be fervent and intense, not necessarily long and loud, that's not what passionate means, but fervent, you know, intense. You know, we're appealing to God, our Father, right, who loves us, and so we plead passionately to God. Our prayers must be principled, meaning I'm not going to God when I sin, you know, and, and I'm going to him for repentance, but I'm telling him what Sister Winsome did. Oh, but, you know, I did this, but do you know what Winsome did? You know, you know what Sister J did? And, you know, sometimes we try to gossip with God. Yeah, and God, you know, she did that. God make our pity not come to nothing. And, you know, and we pray these, these things because our prayers are not principled. But when we go to God, especially in repentance, our prayers must have some principle. He didn't concentrate on you and your sin and your need to repent and your need for forgiveness. And don't try to gossip with God about other people, right? And our prayers, of course, must be productive. They must effect change. If you're just praying and there's no change, then your prayers are not effective. The word of God says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We want our prayers to avail much, to accomplish what we went to pray about, to accomplish the expected end. So if you went to God for forgiveness, you want to come away with forgiveness. So your prayers must be productive. All right, so let's look at David's prayer. And, I, and we're continuing in Psalm 51. I'm not going to do all of it, but this is a part of David's prayer. And his prayer actually starts from verse 1. In fact, the entire Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance. But just looking at a couple of verses, verse 7 says, He prays, Purge me with his up, and I shall be clean, and wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. What does purge mean? It means to remove, to expel to get rid of something that is unwanted and undesirable. That should be our prayer of repentance because sin is undesirable and unwanted. And so when we go to God, we want to pray, God purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was just something that the priest used to dip in either blood or water. For, it was used for cleansing. All right. And because Jesus is our high priest, we want him to dip us with that hyssop and cleanse us 
um, also. And so David says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Why do we need to be washed? Because sin makes you dirty. Because sin makes you filthy. Because sin contaminates you. And so we need to be purged of it. Remove um, the sins from us. And we need to be cleansed. And he says in verse 9, hide thy face from my sins and blot out my, trans my iniquities. That's him, you know, continuing to pray for God. And that word blot out, that little phrase, it has the connotation of somebody who is in a grave debt. Like, let's say money owes a lot of money. And you're appealing to the creditor to wipe it out for you and to give you a clean slate to start out with, as if you don't owe them. We call it bad debt, right? You wipe it out, and you start anew, and it's like, I did not owe you. So that's what that blotting out is. David is asking God, give me a clean slate to start with. Blot out the transgressions and the iniquities and the sins that I have, and give me a clean slate to start with, which we know that God did. Just one thing to say about um, prayer. When we pray, it should be based on who God is and not who we are. Right? We pray based on not on our position. David did not go to God saying, you know, I'm the king and, you know, I want to keep my authority and, you know, God, I'm going to look bad in the eyes of the people. If you do this, no. He appealed to who God is, the merciful God, the holy God, the justice, the just God. Our prayers are not based on who we are. Our prayers are, are based on who God is. So it's nothing about us. It's all about God and his credentials, not ours. All right, step three, seek in the face of God. So the word of God says, humble yourselves, pray, and then we seek the face of God. How do we seek the face of God? So seeking his face is completely different from seeking his hand. Right? And I hope we know the difference between seeking the face of God and seeking the hand of God. When you seek the hand of God, you're asking him for something. God, give me a house. Give me a car. Give me a husband. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me something. I want something tangible from you. When we seek the face of God, we're seeking his presence. We're seeking, you know, to just be in his face, you know, worshiping him and, and seeking a relationship with him. That's seeking the face of God. And so if we're going to seek the face of God, there are two things that we need to recognize. One is the source of our sin. Does anybody know the source of our sin? The source of our sin is the heart. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And in Matthew 15, it says, what comes out of our heart are evil plans, theft, murders, adulteries, and it gives us a whole list of things that come out of our heart. And so when we sin, it's because we have a heart condition. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing with our heart that we sin. So one we must recognize that the source of our sin is our heart. James says that we're drawn away by our own lust and enticed, right? And two, we must recognize that we're incapable of changing our hearts or ourselves. So Ezekiel 36, 25 says, Then I, God, will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I, God, cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. So we, once we realize we cannot change our own hearts, but God can. He can put a new heart in us. He can put a new spirit in us. He can cause us to obey him. Right? And so it is God that works in us. That's, that's what... Um, Philippians 2.13 says, right, it is God that works in, in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not we doing it by our own willpower, not we trying to change our hearts and do good ourselves because we cannot, right, but God giving us a new heart and God working in us. It's all about the spirit of God working in us to cleanse us. And so David knew these two things, that he had, one, that he had a heart problem, and two, that he couldn't change it himself, right? And so when he went to God to pray, he was able to just pinpoint this, right? And several Bible scholars think that this verse, verse 10, is the central verse in all of that chapter. Verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God. What's a clean heart? Here are some adjectives, a pure heart, 
an honest heart, a sincere heart, an honorable heart, a new heart, a heart that is free from sin and guilt, a spotless heart, a stain-free heart, an uncontaminated heart, a blameless heart, a heart that is above suspicion, a heart that is unimpeachable. When we ask God for a clean heart, that's what we're asking him for. That's the new heart that we want him to put in us. And David says, you know, and renew a right spirit. The fact that he's saying renew a right spirit meaning, means he had it before, but it's no longer there. And so it's very possible to have had a clean heart and to have had a right spirit, but you no longer have it. And so if you're sinning, but you're basing, you know, your, your holiness on what you used to do before or, or, you know, what you did 10 years ago, you might not have a clean heart right now. And you might not have a, a, a right spirit. What's a right spirit? A steadfast spirit, a faithful spirit, a committed spirit, an unwavering spirit, a resolute and reliable spirit, a trustworthy spirit, a devoted and a dependable spirit, an uncompromising spirit, a spirit that is willing to obey God. That's the right spirit that we want. And so that's what David went to God and asked him for. And he wasn't... what. That's him seeking the face of God. And when we seek the face of God, those are the things that we ask him for. Not houses and lands and, you know, all these material things. Those, that's seeking the, the hand of God. But when you seek the face of God, you're seeking the things that pertain to life and to godliness. You're seeking the things that help you to maintain a relationship with God. You're seeking the things that God likes, the spiritual things that he has for us. That's seeking the face of God. And you can compare David seeking the face of God with Saul, who never saw it, right? When Saul was said, when Samuel told Saul, hey, you have not obeyed God. What did Saul say? Hey, but yeah, still turn with me and worship me so that, you know, I look good in front of the people. David didn't ask to remain king. David didn't ask for anything material. God, David asked for a clean heart and a right spirit. And so he was interested in having a relationship with God, not maintaining his position, right? Not maintaining his giftings. A lot of times we just want to remain, you know, the head of the department, or we just want to, you know, God, people to still think that we are okay with God. And so we want to run around and worship and speak in tongues till we're blue, and we know that we're not right with God. That's not a right heart, a clean heart, or a steadfast spirit. And so we have to be honest when we come to God and we have to seek those things that are eternal and those things that foster a relationship with God, not just, you know, houses and lands and husbands and cars. All right. So God, David continues to seek the face of God. In verse 11, he says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And I, I am very, I take this verse very seriously. Um, because just to think, if David says, cast me not away from thy present presence, it means that this omnipresent God, who David said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. And if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost part of the earth, thou art there. And yet, this omnipresent God can cast me out of his presence. That's scary, that you're not even in the presence of an omnipresent God. He says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, which means he can give you his spirit and he can take back his spirit. He took back his spirit from Saul. He said the spirit of God left him and he sent an evil spirit to torment him. So it cannot be a nice place if you are not in God's presence and you don't have his spirit. And so in seeking God, we have to make sure that we are in his presence and that we have this right spirit within us, that he has not taken away his spirit from us. And of course, intimacy with God is totally impossible if we don't have a right spirit. If we have unconfessed sins, if we have not repented, we don't have any intimacy with God. You can run around, you can pray for an hour, you can do whatever. If you have not repented from your sin, the intimacy with God is no longer there, right? That's why we repent to get back into relationship with him. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Why? Because when there is unrepented sins, there is the absence of joy 
and peace. There is no joy and peace. You can be in sin, and, and honestly, some sins are pleasurable. You can enjoy them for a time. They might make you happy for a while, but they're not satisfying, and they're not lasting. That's the difference. The Word of God says, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. You don't experience fullness of joy outside of the presence of God, and that's why we seek his presence. All right, and so when we seek for God, we have to search for him with all of our hearts. We have to make sure that we crave his presence and we know that his presence is necessary for us to have a relationship with him. And he says, if you seek me, you will find me if you search for me with all of your heart. And so with this heart of ours, even though it can be desperately wicked, we search for him with all of our hearts. And that's why we need a clean heart. And that's why we need a steadfast spirit so that we can search for God and find him with it. Amen? So here's the clincher step four. It says, turn from your wicked ways. So humble yourselves, pray, seek his face, and the last step is turn from your wicked ways. Steps one to three means nothing if you have not turned. If you humble yourself and you pray and seek God's face, but you don't turn, you have not repented. All right? And so repentance is not complete without a 180 degree turn. I, I know repentance is a military term, right? And I know you have watched them and seen the soldiers marching up, two, three, four, right? And when the, when the, when the lieutenant or, or, or the sergeant says, repent, what do they do? So they're going this way. And when he says, repent, opposite direction. And so when you repent, you go in the opposite direction. It's not a 360 turn because if you do a 360, you're going to end up where you started. You're going in the opposite direction of where you were going. The evidence of true repentance is a changed behavior. The word of God says we're to bring forth um, fruits, meat for repentance. You know what that means? Bring forth the evidence of your repentance. The evidence of your repentance is that you have changed your behavior. How do we know that David repented? Because he changed his behavior. How do we know that we have repented? When we change our behavior, right? How do you know that an apple tree is an apple tree? Because it has apples on it. If you go outside and there's a tree with big, nice, pretty green leaves and there's no fruit on it, you don't know what kind of tree it is. When you recognize the tree is when you fruit. So if you see orange, it's an orange tree. And if you see apple, it's an apple tree. And if you see mango, it's a mango. That's how you identify. So we're identified, right, that we have repented when our behavior has changed. That's how we, are, uh, we know that we have repented. Repentance that produces no lasting change is insincere. So if we change for a little while and then we go back to our sin, we, had, we did not repent. Because repentance means you don't go back. David never went back to murdering anybody innocently, and David never went back to adultery. He never went back. I was in the office the other day with PJ, PJ's um, pastor's dog, uh, and and he, I don't know what he ate, but he, but he vomited on the floor. And I was like, all right, let me get some paper towel. By the time I grabbed the paper towel, he had licked up back all his vomit. When we go back to our sin, and we say, ew, right, nasty. It was, it was gross. It was disgusting. But when we go back to our sin, that's what it looks like to God. He says you're like a dog that goes back to its vomit. So that's how gross it, and disgusting it looks to God. And if we can keep that in mind that that's what our sin and going back to our sin looks like, we wouldn't go back to it because we would see how disgusting and how nasty it is. Jesus himself, he said, these people worship me with their lips and honor me with their, with their mouths, but their hearts are far from it. But when we repent and we have a clean heart and a changed heart, we don't go back. And so if you sincerely repent, you don't go back to the sin. You might commit other sins, but the one you have repented of, you don't go back to it. Because it's not like we don't sin or we don't have other sins or we're sinless, but you don't go back when you have truly repented of a sin. All right. Um, how did David turn from his wicked ways? Verse 13 says, 
Um, he says, then will I teach transgressors thy way, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And so J David changed his behavior, and now he wanted to teach those who would transgress the law of God and tell them that it's not a nice thing to do, right? It comes with consequences. And he became a worshiper. He was singing, and we know what a worshiper David was, right? Sister Moza taught us that two weeks ago. Um, but that was the evidence of his changed behavior. And so when we repent, the evidence is that we change. And so genuine repentance results in a change of the mind, a change of the heart, a change of direction, a change of conduct, a change of attitude. I don't have time to go through all of it, but that's what changed. We change our mindset. We change how we look at sin. We have a heart now that sincerely wants to obey God. We change our direction. We even change our attitude towards sin. We don't look at sin as, you know, just nothing or God will understand. We now see what God sees with our sin. And that is why you cannot repent for somebody. Because you have to change your mind and your attitude and your heart and your conduct. And you cannot do that for somebody. They have to do that themselves. I would repent for my son. But if I change my mind and my heart and my conduct and he's still doing what he's doing, then I cannot repent for him. Right? And so repentance is a personal thing that everybody has to come to the place. Remember we said in the first place, repentance is when you have perceived with your mind that you are wrong and you make a change. All right? And so you cannot change somebody's mind for them. All right? So we don't repent for people. We intercede for them. That they come to a place of repentance. And so um, requirements for repentance. Verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God and the only acceptable sacrifices for God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. We cannot buy our repentance. We cannot give more offering for God to be pleased with us. We cannot come to church more often. You know, we cannot start participating and keep our sin. All right? The only sacrifices for sin is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And God knows if it's a performance or not. So, you know, sometimes we come and we bawl at the altar and snot running down our nose and we hoop and holler and carry on. But if your heart has not changed, you have not repented. So it's not in the performance. It's in the changed heart and the changed mind and the changed behavior and the changed attitude and the changed conduct. That's how you know that you have repented. Not we just running up and down and snotting. Because I've run up and down and snotted before and still go back. But you have to truly repent. Amen? Amen. What is the result of repentance? When we repent, one, God hears, right? He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, I will not hear you. So you can pray loud and you can pray long. But if I'm not talking to you, I can pray for two hours. God is not listening to me. Because he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, I'm not listening to you. I don't hear you. So we can pretend for other people and pretend that, we, you know, oh, I hear from God and God hears from me. No, he's not hearing you. It needs a repentant heart. Two, God forgives. He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God heals. He says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. And in Jeremiah 3.22, he says, return ye, ye backsliding children and I will heal your backsliding. So repentance, what are the benefits of repentance? God hears you. Here's your prayer. Here's your cries. God forgives you because he's a merciful God and God heals you. Why does he need to heal you? Because sin makes us sick. And so he needs to heal our heart and heal our soul and heal our minds of our backslidings and of our mess. And so he heals us. So just a few things I want to point out. Oh boy, let me see. I'm, oh, okay, let me hurry up. Um, repentance does not necessarily remove the natural consequences of of, of sins. And so even though you repent, it doesn't mean, and God forgives you and he heals you, it doesn't mean you're not going to suffer any consequences. For David, the child still died, right? And for you, somebody on death row who is um, destined to be hanged or whatever, just because they repent doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're going to get a pardon. It doesn't necessarily mean God can, but it's not necessarily um, so that you're going to escape from the natural consequences because God is a just God and a holy God and he must punish sin, right? 
So he's, he's not going to allow us to sin successfully. Because if you sin and he does nothing, guess what we're going to do? Keep sinning. Oh, I got away with this one. Let me try another one. And so he cannot allow us to sin successfully. Because sin demands a holy and a just response from a holy God. So just to talk about uh, the power of repentance. The two things that repentance done is one, it reconciles us with God. Because sin disturbs the peace that we have with God. And so when we repent, it brings back the peace and the reconciliation and the relationship that we have with God. What else? It highlights God's mercy. His amazing, measureless, undeserved grace. His unconditional, eternal, unchanging love. His limitless mercy. When we repent and, and he forgives us, that's what it highlights. Not necessarily how sinful we are, but how loving and merciful and long-suffering and patient and gracious God is. Because it's always all about him, not us. All right? And that's the power of repentance. And so what do I want us to take away? God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. We cannot sit and linger in our sin. In Ezekiel 33, he says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for will, why will ye die, O house of Israel? And that's just the message to, for all of us this morning. Why will we die in our sins when we can turn and live? God has given us this, this path to repentance. You know, that is not that... It's not that hard, is it, to humble yourselves and pray and seek the face of God and to turn? Doesn't a holy, just God deserve our love and our loyalty and our steadfastness? And so that's my message this morning. Like, why will we die? Why die, Carleen? Why die, Sister Lana? Why die, Brother Sean, when we can turn and live? Amen? Anybody wants to live this morning? So we have to turn. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you and I bless you and I praise you, God. Lord, create in us clean hearts and right spirits this morning, oh God. Search all of our hearts, our minds, the deep recesses of where we hide the sins, God. Pride and envy and greed and gluttony and all the things that nobody else sees but you, God. And this morning, we just want to ask you to forgive us. We repent. We change our mind, change our hearts and our attitude and our behavior. Lord God, we want to seek your face and we want to be more like you. We sing all the time just to be like Jesus while you're sinless and you're humble God and we want to be just like you so mm -hmm. forgive us oh God as we repent before you in Jesus name oh we thank you Jesus we thank you Lord we thank you Heavenly Father God that we have a high priest Lord God we thank you Lord God that you're making